I didn't want to be involved with CRISPR. I had businesses to run, I had newsletters to write, and I was involved in writing a very large, large-scale novel, which is really hard to do. So I had heard that the biohackers that I knew were really excited about something called CRISPR. 2013, 2014, I'm not sure precisely which. And I thought, well, that's really nice. These guys are really interesting guys. They're interested, you know, they find cool stuff and I'm sure it's great. I can't be involved in this right now. I just can't, I have too many things to do. Time went on and I finished some of these projects and I had a little bit more time on my hand than I still heard about CRISPR and I just still wasn't ready to dive into something new. It was just too much. And then I ended up being invited to a conference in Panama of all places. And we had a small little meeting and Jeffrey Brown of the Exponential Tech Newsletter was giving a presentation on CRISPR. So fine, now I have time. I'm sitting here, it's a very small little meeting and I've just had a nice breakfast with friends and I'm sitting down, okay, I can do this now. And he begins going through this and I have enough of a scientific background that I can really understand what he's talking about. And I'm listening and I'm listening and I reached a, a quiet part in the presentation. Like I say, it was a very small group and I said, he says, yes, 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 please ask, ask questions. And I said, okay, you're telling me that this is the way nature has been splicing genes for however many centuries and millennia, millions of years. He says, yes. And you're telling me that we learned how to do this and we can do this ourselves on purpose. And he said, yes. And I said, this, we can do this, you know, this is not, we're waiting for a few more things to happen in 10 years from now when it gets through all the research. We can do this now. He says, today, right now we can do this. And I said, and this works on what organisms? He says, all of them. And I started laughing. This was not the laugh of making fun of somebody. This was the laugh of when you see a little baby or a little, little guy who learns something and he goes <sighs> like this. This was the laugh. Because if you think about this, and I could understand why he was saying it, this is gigantic. Now let me talk a little bit about this, show you some things. Here is the first little piece of proof. I, I, I guess it comes out fairly well in this picture. These are identical dogs, except one of them had one particular little protein edited out of its genome. It has twice the muscle mass of the dog on the right. Just one edit. Here's two other dogs. You can see it a little, little more clearly here, maybe. The one on the left has twice the muscle mass as the one on the right. Now, this is just an experiment done with dogs and it doesn't really harm the dogs. One, you know, who cares if one is a little stronger than the other? It works and it works really, really well. Here's another. This is recent. First time ever US scientists have corrected a genetic code for a heart condition. This is a fatal heart condition. They just edited it right out of the DNA. It's not particularly hard to do. I'll talk about the complications and the difficulties as we go, but this was just done recently. And it, they, you can pull out a trouble section of DNA and replace it with a better section. Boom, done. Whoops, too many. Okay, here we go. This one, they eliminated HIV in living animals, not just in a test tube, but in living animals. They've eliminated it in um, one experiment with pigs and another with mice. And it's much harder to, to eliminate something from a full organism than it is from a single cell. Now both can be done with CRISPR. 
A full organism is obviously harder, requires more treatments, and so on. But the mechanism just plain works. And it's been there the whole time. It's been there for thousands, millions of years. We just didn't know, and we stumbled upon it. Here's another one. This is one of the um, excision of HIV, just removing a, the HIV virus from living animals. This is the very fancy scientific paper. Here's just one more, uh, eliminated to remove toxic RNA, which could treat RNA-related diseases, of which there are hundreds or thousands. We can just edit them right out. Now, just so we're clear on this, um, this is a structure of DNA. It's like a twisted ladder. And each of these rungs in here, like the rungs of the ladder, are two different proteins. And I won't go through all the details on it, but it's essentially one big, long, twisted ladder. And in a human genome, it's three billion rungs long. It's huge. And that's in each of our cells. CRISPR is an addressing system that allows special molecules to find the right spot on the DNA. CRISPR is, has one of these long scientific names. I think I can get it. Clusteredly random interspace palindromic repeats. Don't try to remember it. It's not important. But if you see on, on this twisted ladder of DNA, the rungs that they're showing here just as gray, and there's little marks on the side of them, those, these are these randomly interspaced palindromic repeats. And they are an addressing system that runs up and down the DNA. And it's been there the whole time. We just didn't know. The real breakthrough on this came in a Danish yogurt lab. And yogurt makers are very concerned with bacteria. And they were looking really hard at these various bacteria that were causing problems for them. And they kept saying, huh, what is this? What, 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 are, what are these things here? Why are they there? What are they doing? And then eventually somebody said, you know what? I think they have to do with their uh, mechanisms of, of protecting themselves from viruses. Huh. Hmm. And finally they put it together and they realized what it was and it was, you know. <laughs> this is the molecule that does the work. This, there's several versions of it. They call them CAS molecules. Just, CAS just stands for CRISPR associated. There's a bunch of them. The one they usually use is called Cas9, because I presume it's the ninth one they found. This is Cas4. It's easier to show in a drawing, so I picked this one. But you look how complicated this molecule is. It's like a gigantic electromechanical machine, and it's in all of our cells already. It, this is, you want nanotechnology, nanobots? Right there. This is one. And it's there, it's immensely complex. And what it does, its job, is that it splices DNA. It finds the spot on the DNA, and then it clips it and cuts it out. That's what it does, and it's what it's been doing for two, three, four million years, whatever the number is. And we didn't know. And you can see here in this picture the, the orange DNA, and it brings it into itself and kind of spreads it out and finds the spot and clips it. And it, you know, we don't have to, you know, do some magic to make it work. It, it, it lives, so to speak, to do this. Now here is, how, again, how they found it. Viruses are these nasty-looking, you know, machine animal things. Um, they've been very nasty to humanity over a lot of years. We fight viruses all the time. However, one of these days we're going to learn how to use these things. And we do already to some extent. You want to do some, use something that can fix DNA, that can get something into your DNA? A virus is built to do precisely that. That's the only way they can reproduce. So what they do is they attach down to this cell or whatever, and they squeeze in their DNA. 
That's their job. That's what they do. And that's what the CRISPR system, what the people in the yogurt lab and others, the blur, I'm simplifying. This is what they found out, that CRISPR exists to splice out the viral DNA. That's what it's been doing all of these years, splicing out viral DNA that doesn't belong there. Okay, let me give you a real basic explanation of how this stuff works. We won't take too long on it. Let's look in the left. We have the guide RNA, the cutting protein, and the replacement DNA. The guide RNA finds the spot, okay? That spot on the side of, of the long string of DNA that we want to get. That It's the address and says, go here. The cutting protein is the one that locks into place and cuts where we want to cut. And then we also put in a piece of replacement DNA. That's the right DNA we want to put in there instead of the DNA that's causing whatever, multiple sclerosis or cancers or whatever. Okay? We just replace it. You know, step one, the, the RNA finds the target, the address. Number two, the Cas9 cuts the DNA. And number three, the new DNA makes its way into place. And this is about how it looks in real life. Um, it's, you don't have to really, it's a little complicated, but it gets in place. The protein holds the DNA, finds a spot, and clips it. Um, let me just go briefly through this so you understand. Uh, number one, step number one is to identify the, the DNA that we want to change. It's important that you find exactly the right piece of DNA to change. And you can say, well, we know that it's in a certain spot on a normal human genome, but you have to check for that person, let's say, because we're, our DNA is not exactly identical from person to person. So you've got to check and make sure you've got the right spot. You don't want to play guesses with genomes. So you make sure you've got the right spot. You manufacture this, the little piece of, of addressing DNA or RNA to find the spot. And there are labs that are manufacturing this every day. It's easy. And then you get the proper molecule to do this, put everything together in the cell, with the hard part is getting everything in, put everything in the cell, wait for it to work, and verify that it worked. That's it. Now, there's complications along the way in some of the details, but this is the process. It's a very simple process. Now, here's why it's so cheap now. The cost of sequencing, of reading a human genome, went down from on the left there. You can't quite make it out in the graph. At 2001, it cost $100 million to sequence a human genome. In, let's say, 2007, uh, 2008, it was $10 million. In 2000. Nine, it was a hundred thousand. Now it's a thousand bucks, maybe less, to sequence an entire human genome. Three point two billion base pairs, a thousand bucks. And I'll prove this to you. Has anybody ever seen this service? Right? Ancestry service, ninety-nine dollars. What they do is they send you a little kit, you swab your cheek, you put it in an envelope, you mail it to them, and two weeks later you get a report on where your people came from. Your DNA came from 32% from Ireland, 42% from Italy, 20, whatever, whatever it is. And they do this with DNA sequencing. They don't have to sequence the entire genome, but they know which parts to pick. And they can do this and mail it back to you and make a profit for $99. So how hard is this now? And if you want to get the fancy one, the Health, health and Ancestry Service, where they check if you're liable to have this disease or that disease or whatever, it's 200 bucks. And this is real, live DNA sequencing right now. It's stunning that we can do this. Uh, it's the type of thing that you have to get used to the idea that this is really possible. We, this, is, this is for real. We can really do this. It's not just some 
you know, we all hear ideas where people say, oh, we can do this, and we can do this. They're actually doing this and making a profit. Now, to show you how easy this is, this is a photo from a CRISPR party that we had earlier this year. And these are people who are not lab technicians, like construction workers. And we had a CRISPR party, and we spliced DNA at a kitchen table. Very average uh, suburb of uh, a very average house, and very average people splicing DNA at a kitchen table. And it worked. That is a culture of bacteria growing where it has no place being. For those who are really scientific on this such thing, it is a, uh, a non-harmful strain of E. coli run, uh, growing on a canamycin agar. That's the fancy terms. It's bacteria growing where it cannot grow unless you change its DNA. And we did this. We all got around and we had our little pipettes and we did our little lab stuff and we mixed this and put this with this and got it together and then we had to wait two days for every we had to wait a couple of hours for it to transfect the cell there's all these fancy words around it just means get it inside the cell you know you put everything together in some special chemical that kind of opens up the cell wall a little bit cell membrane when i was in school it was cell wall now it's cell membrane um, that opens up the cell membrane a little bit and gets and it gets inside there and once it's all inside there it does what it's what it's programmed to do so we had to wait for that and you know we had to heat it up and then cool it off and a couple things like that but in the end we got bacteria that could grow where bacteria can't grow and we did it by changing its DNA now this is a very benign bacteria <laughs> no one needs to worry we're not creating you know Frankensteins here um, but it's easy. Now, there are certain applications that are much harder. It's like I say, it's hard to get things inside of a human cell uh, as opposed to, you know, a bacteria. Human cells are much more complicated. But there are ways to do it. It's being done al already. Just to show you how available these things are, here's a just almost a randomly chosen web page. CRISPR and Cas9 plasmids and resources. I'll explain a little bit about that later. But they've got all these resources and all this stuff, and they're selling this. And look what they have here at the bottom. They've got two different kinds. If you want to cut both strands of DNA, or maybe you only want to cut one strand of the DNA. We'll make it for you. We got it. We can do it. We'll ship it to you next week. And it's not expensive. So they've got this right now. Here's another one. This guide RNA that we say finds the address. These guys were giving it away for free. Okay? Now this was a lost leader, obviously. They were giving it away for free so that they would get more business from you. The point is, they were able to give it away for free. It's just not that expensive. Yeah. Now this is the, you know, this again, these terminologies, you got to get used to the terms, you know, they're Greek and they're Latin. Why? Oh, well, historical reasons. It, they're not that many of them. It's not that hard. Um, but, you know, you've got to learn. And, they're, and the, it's funny because when you look at some of these terminologies, you know, it sounds very frightening, you know. Endocytosis, phagocytosis, and... You know, and this is just a way for things to get inside of a cell. The one that made me laugh, as you see on the left here, there's the, these bumps here where the solid particle is kind of making a little bag and going into the cell. They're called pseudopodiums that are coming out there. You know what that means? Fake foot. Okay? There's come the fake feet that are going to come and swallow the thing up. It's just in Latin, so it sounds very scary. Um, but it's all, this is just some of the processes whereby they get all this stuff inside of a cell. There are a lot of them. Uh, there's ones where you put an electric field over them, you give them a voltage you know, of a certain magnitude, and it tends to open up the cell wall so things can get inside. There are ways to do it using viruses to get things inside. Um, there's all sorts of ways. This one is cool. 
Uh, this is called a liposome. Very fancy, fancy words. What it is, it's a little tiny nano balloon. And they're in our cells all the time. We, I mean, we've, our cells are full of these things. And what it is, is it's essentially a layer of fat or wax with stuff in the middle. And we can now very easily make these things and put some DNA in the middle. And we can, if we want, we can stick in various types of medicines or whatever and put them in these things. And they usually go very well into cells. And as a matter of fact, if you, now you probably didn't notice because it went too fast, but these guys are selling plasmids. So, which involves liposomes. Um, you can get them right now. They are incredible little machines. Uh, this thing you see on the side, on the right side, is a homing peptide. It's got a little protein sticking out there that knows how to find the spot where you want to send it. It helps find its spot. My God, these things have been there the whole time. And you can pick the right ones who know how to find certain spots and can get through certain kinds of cells. And it's known. This isn't, you know, oh, maybe this will, this is known how to do this. Now this is the, the another one of these stunning things. Um, every organism has its own DNA, which are usually these, you know, twisted ladder long strings of DNA. But they also have these little circles of DNA called plasmids. And these little circles are extra DNA for something that activates when it sees a certain type of germ or something that activates in a certain situation and it gets involved and produces something, produces a bunch of proteins that the cell takes and uses to make something else. It's stunning, but it's been in there the whole time. And we found that we can make our own custom plasmids. And what we can do is we can put in the signal RNA, this is the addressing RNA on the top left, we can add in the Cas9 molecule, the cutting protein, and package them all in a big circle and get them into the cells. And it's not hard. So, um, it's not just humans and animals. We have, we can turn yeast into plastics and adhesives. We can make better biofuels. We can make nylon and urethanes from simple acids rather than oil. We can, oh, they already have mushrooms that don't get brown. They've already got those. Um, and here's my favorite that doesn't exist yet. Dwarf grass that doesn't have to be cut. I mean, they've got fruit trees that only grow this tall. Why not grass that only goes this tall? Right? That's the one I want. <laughs> But uh, this is all, uh, uh, anything can be done. And if you think about all the industrial processes, things that we use plants for, things that we use all sorts, of, it's, it's gigantic. There are literally millions of applications. And it's so easy, a lot of it can be done in a very small laboratory. It takes practice, of course. But it doesn't have to be a multi-million dollar laboratory. The CRISPR party, we had 10 people, and we did everything, including the tools, for $400. It's not that hard. At least, not all of it is. Now, we're just about out of time, and I, and I, I bet you there are going to be questions, and that's cool. Uh, we have some time for that, but here's the questions that I think of when I see this. Are we prepared to handle, our, to handle human evolution? Are we prepared to handle our own physical evolution? Now, you know, you say, yeah, well, I think I can, but what does that mean to the society at large? We're really going to change the way humanity sees itself. Most of us have been raised, conditioned to think that, well, you know, we have to have laws, otherwise people will be crazy and do terrible things. And we learn to distrust each other and to, you know, somebody we see on the street is a threat. And we think about, you know, our weaknesses and rather than our strengths. This may change. This is obviously just one technology. But when we can, if we can control our own physical evolution, what else does that say about us? I'm not sure. 
Um, will we freak out when somebody uses this badly? Well, someday somebody is going to use this badly. It'll, the first ones to do it will probably be the people who make chemical weapons, those kinds of guys. Um, but eventually somebody's going to be, some bastard is going to use this to do something ugly. Well, that sucks, but we're going to have to not freak out over this when it happens. People use everything badly. You can kill a guy with a hammer. Does that mean we outlaw hammers? So this is going to be a, a moment with CRISPR the first time somebody uses it badly. Hope, hopefully that doesn't happen for a while. But there will be thousands upon thousands of good cases, and of course TV news and everybody else will obsess on the one freakout case. Well, it, it'll come eventually, and we're going to have to be prepared for that. Um, are we going to allow authority to protect us from, uh, from CRISPR? What if, it, what if the choice is to either obey or prevent mental retardation in a child? Are we willing to be outlaws? It's a good question. But when you have a child, the parents are both, uh, sadly, have that in their families. Are you going to tell them that they can't fix their, their unborn child? Okay. These are the kind of choices that all of a sudden we face with this technology. And if, and, if, and if the fear wins, and there are fear sellers on this already, then are we willing to take matters into our own hands? We're able to. It's not hard. Are we willing to? These are really hard questions. So I think that's about time for the presentation. If anybody has questions, hit me. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. I have a question to this, what you said on the slide. How hypothetically is the choice to prevent mental retardation on unborn child if we are, at least in some cases, already able or if it's something what is related to the future? Oh, um, are we able to do that, you mean? Uh, yes, we are pretty well able now. The hard part is getting everything in the cells at the same time, but human embryos have already been edited and successfully. It happened already. Now, I don't know if it was exactly that, that gene, but human embryos in China have been edited. They didn't bring them to, to birth. They edited them and waited for a week and made sure that it was, you know. They interrupted it then? Or what? I think they got embryos left over from in vitro fertilization that the parents said, you know, these are embryos we're not going to use and you can do a scientific experiment on them provided you don't bring them to term. Ah, it's a pity. Thank you. Sure, and it worked. Why would you only want to cut one strand of the DNA? There are certain applications where that's all that's damaged, and you can just take that out rather than the other and it, it, um, it works just a little bit better. We, you know, we have, these things aren't perfect, so it's a little more likely to, to, it's a little more precise to do it that way in some cases. I'll ask while I'm walking, uh, <laughs> how difficult is to ban any part of it? To what? To ban, to regulate. Is there something that is easy to regulate? It's the regulators, um, there's an entire, a huge medical regulatory system in pretty much every country. This is coming along now and regulations move slowly. Uh, you know, if, if something changes, you need so many years and, and to get politicians to, to be aware of it and to try to write laws and to bait laws and get them through committee and get them signed. And it takes time, fortunately. And um, it hasn't come yet. And right now, some of the first people to make the first discoveries are fighting about patents. And so all the action right now is mostly going into patents. Uh, there are some people who are selling fear on the subject. A group out of Berkeley, California, I think it's the University of Cal Berkeley. There's a group there who are trying to frighten people about this, essentially. Um, but regulation is a problem. 
Uh, it hasn't really addressed it too much yet, uh, but it's it's a concern going forward. Um, have you read uh, Daniel Suarez's book, Change Agent? About which book? Daniel Suarez is one of the more famous uh, sci-fi authors. He's I have not. He has written a, a good book about uh, the whole thing called Change Agent, and he's basically trying to, to think through what it happens, and he ends up in saying, okay, if regulation is overdone, there will be an underground economy yes. basically providing the services because there is the request of people not just wanting to fix their unborn child but to want to self-optimize and fix things that they don't like about their body not just health concerns but also yeah everything else that can be fixed and so what do you think would be in, in a reasonable way forward saying okay um, this there's obviously a market and we need to somehow figure out how to cope with society with this new properties and how to make sure this will not end up as a service that is just available to the super rich and to people who think they are better than others. Uh, what, what is your thinking about what is an, a reasonable way of yeah, not doing classical regulation on that? Right. The, the way, obviously, that I prefer is for there to be no regulation at all and uh, let Humans self-regulate pretty damn well if you let them. And if you have a regulator, then his friends get out of regulation. The regulation is imposed upon everyone else. This, this, the story that was great was Bernie Madoff, that big financial scam guy in the United States. He was investigated by the SEC twice. Twice! And they cleared him twice. So regulation is a really bad thing as far as I'm concerned. And uh, the longer they stay out of it, the farther they stay out of it, the happier I am. Um, there will be some things that will go wrong eventually. The wonderful thing about CRISPR is that whatever you do, you can just as easily undo. So if you do something and it doesn't look like it's going right, you can just use the same process in reverse and pretty well get rid of it. Now, eventually, somewhere, something's going to go bad. What can you do? There's nothing. But the more the regulators stay out of it, the happier I am. And eventually, if it goes, if they get too hard, people will do it themselves. And it's not, like I say, we had a CRISPR party and a very average house at the kitchen table. So, you know, I wouldn't want to, you couldn't do that for, you know, eliminating, I don't know, cancer in somebody. You'd need a little more than that. But it's not, it's not a huge stretch. Do you, do you find that a lot of the CRISPR community has this, like, for the greater good mentality, like, well, if we eliminate uh, the potential for AIDS or cancer or retardation in everyone eventually, then it's okay to take a bunch of unborn babies from people who never consented to it and experiment on them. There's a reason why this kind of stuff is being um, studied mostly right now in China and India, and what are your thoughts on that? And I know personally you have a background that is quite ethical and aligned with mine to some degree of rapport. So I'm really interested, like, I know it's very exciting, but there is, to me, an incredible dark side to this kind of thing. Okay, good question. Um, how shall I say? There are things that can go wrong. There are things that will go wrong. The very last people I would want to make sure things go right is the state. They would be the last people I would hire to make sure that this went well. Um, the biohackers that I know, I don't by any means know all of them, uh, but the ones that I know are very ethical, very serious people, and they're working on things like a special, a special technique to get rid of HIV. And it is really effective. Um, and so they're working on things like that. All of them that I know are very serious, ethical people. It's possible that there's going to be a bad guy among them. Some, eventually there will. Uh, but I would rather have... I would, I would pick the state last of all. Well, really what we need for this, for this is if we're going to have a real free business is an industry association. Some group of people in the business that say, look, we're going to make people comfortable. 
we're going to say that this person who's doing this, we have looked at them, we have talked to them, they are competent, we will certify that they are competent, and you can trust in them. I think that's what we'll end up ha having, and I think that's a much better model because it's non-monopolistic, it's not violence-based, and people can, can pick a good one or not a good one. Nothing we do is ever going to be perfect. But I think the industry association model is far more effective in real life with real people than the state regulatory idea. Because, this, again, the Bernie Madoff story, but if, if you get regulators, this technology is going to be available to them and their friends and it will be withheld. I mean, there'll be two clinics in you know, Geneva and Luxembourg that you can't get into unless you have a gazillion dollars or friends, and they'll be doing this all the time. And the rest of us, they'll give you little dribs and drabs here and there to keep us happy. That's why I see it. Um, so uh, you, the, most of the examples you have used are about uh, a small organism, uh, like embryos or bacteria. So my question is, uh, to make it clear, uh, you're saying that this also works for large organisms like a human adult, correct? Yes, that is correct. Now, it's much harder to do in a full organism. There's various ways if, if you can get things in and, in and out to this particular organ, let's say a liver or whatever. Uh, sometimes you can do it with blood and take out so much blood and fix it, edit the genes, put it back in. You might have to do three, four treatments. Um, it's much harder to do in a living organism. But so far, the ones that they've been able to do have worked. Uh, so uh, obviously, like this brings uh, plenty of uh, ethical problems. Like uh, when I put aside that uh, when people come to the point that they say like, uh, okay, we can treat the uh, HIV. So how about if we treat the uh, uh, homosexuality, for example? But um, mm -hmm. uh, how long do you think it will come to the point that the uh, people will be actually able to produce, customize? Uh, like beings, you know, human beings. Like when you play the computer game and you can create the character, you know, like you can choose, like it will be strong like this, intelligent like that. And We're capable of doing some of that right now. Uh, human embryos have been edited and it does work and we can do it and there's many, many things we can do, especially on the embryo level. Many, many things we can do right now. And again, eventually some Buddy is going to do something ugly with this. We can't prevent that. We just, you can't, you know, put everybody in a cage. We just can't. So eventually somebody's going to do something really stupid, and that sucks, but that's humanity at the, at the case. But 99 point whatever percent of the actual uses of this are going to be people who want to make something better to make their children do better, to get rid of a disease, this is going to be the vast, vast majority of what it's used for. But there'll be some schmuck somewhere who does something bad. Maybe we have also to face another uh, situation with the pharma industry. How is the pharma industry reacting? Because if we are talking about curing cancer, we will lose a big business. Big money. Big, big money. The one interesting thing about this in these patent wars that are going on right now is the big pharma companies are involved in the patent wars. They're backing this one or backing that patent. They're competing patents. It's very ugly and complicated. But big pharma is backing some of these people, so they haven't tried to kill it yet. So that's where it stands now. I'm, I'm guessing there is so much money to be made in this that I'm guessing they probably won't try to kill it all together, but maybe they'll try to just keep the prices insane. That's my guess. But again, it's so easy to do yourself or for a small lab to do. But there's a lot of ways to go around it. And then, you know, they tried very hard to eliminate all drugs throughout the entire Western world. And today, you can buy marijuana in pretty much every city of the civilized world or anywhere in the world if you want. And it's not that hard to do, so their regulations are made to be scary. And they'll try to get you know one person and publicize that they got him for doing whatever is forbidden and to frighten everyone else away. 
but there are marijuana sellers in every city in the world. So they're of limited effect in real life. Can I ask, uh, what do we need for CRISPR party? <laughs> okay, um, go to a website called The Odin. The Odin, O-D-I-N, and they'll sell you a CRISPR kit. And I think it's 400, 400 and some dollars. It's, it's not much, and that includes the pipettes and everything. And they'll be, they'll be thrilled to sell it to you. And they've got other stuff too, great site. Uh, okay, hello. I, I would like to just ask, uh, what is uh, the worst scenario which can happen? You just think it takes one guy using this. Uh, what come into your mind? Like how bad it could be? Because you say we just can't freak out of it, but maybe. You know. Right, well, you know, one of the scenarios that everyone goes for is, is you see the picture of the dogs and you say, oh, super soldiers. You know, some guy that's you know, like this and can run, you know, faster than everybody else. Um, I suppose that's a possibility uh, that it really is, doesn't matter that much in the modern world to have a bigger, stronger soldier. It matters a better gun. Um, but there are sorts of things you could, you know, um, to some very considerable degree, I'm not sure what the right number is, uh, sociopaths, sociopathy is a genetically related disease. It tends to run in certain families. And you could make sociopaths on purpose. That would be freaking scary. Um, but a, a lot of those things that if you do it in an existing organism, it tends to be intermittent in the offspring. But if you wanted to build some sociopaths from the embryo up, you probably could. I don't know what kind of monster would do that, but it's possible. I think it is. Um, um, viruses <laughs> is, is a, you know, like a, making a super virus. Sure, that's, that's a possibility too. Um, but if you can make a virus, you can make CRISPR to replace the virus. And it's usually viruses that have a very short lifetime as opposed to, you know, a human being. Uh, there's a, a TV show that was planned for this. I don't know if it's happening. It had uh, Jennifer Lopez was involved with it somewhere called CRISPR. And it was going to show a new, you know, bio crime every week or whatever it is on the show. And uh, I don't think they're doing it. And I sure hope they don't because we don't need fear right now. The fear will come on its own later. We don't need it now. Now, um, kind of uh, here I am. Hey, hello. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay. It's hard. It's hard to see from yeah, up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so coming coming back to that, um, uh, you just mentioned organism, right? It's an organizing um, kind of a compendium of, of cells, and uh, I understood this CRISPR is changing cells one by one, or the, after the, that they uh, multiplying, and so descendants will probably carry the same uh, DNA. Um, but if you're talking about, if you're thinking about organism as as a compendium or a society of cells, and in our body we have more foreign cells as our own, right? And mm -hmm. they kind of uh, self-organizing, uh, interacting. Do, do you think there would be any conflict, or how, how do you think was this technology will relate to this uh, hive or you know organizational um, aspect of our body and, and life? Well, that's a really good question. Biology is very, very complicated. Um, that's why the the uh, process of changing an existing organism is very much harder. Uh, to do than just one cell in, in a, you know, in a test tube. Um, but so far it seems to work well uh, that everything organizes itself around that pretty well because we're not changing a lot. We're just changing little pieces. So it, it seems like it, it goes well. At least so far it's gone very well. And it's been, there have been a number of experiments now. It's been done a lot of times and were big problems to appear we probably would know already. Yes? Hey, uh, in a society where everyone wants to be like a designer self, how do you see that going? If everyone just wants to be like intelligent and smartest person, like everyone would be the same. So wh where does the society go when it becomes like Gattaca, I guess? You know, the, the funny thing is, is that not everybody really does want to be the same. Uh, I've done a little bit of research into things like sperm banks. 
and you find out that if you get uh, one of the, there, there was a, a famous thing several years ago where they got a sperm bank of only certified geniuses. I mean, you know, guys who had won Nobel Prizes, you know, certified geniuses. You would think that people would have lined up to get this, they went out of business. Because the fact that not everybody wanted that level of intelligence. I mean, I, I would think if it were me, that would be the one I would choose if I was, you know, in the market for that. You know, that'd be, I, I might think seriously about, you know, the, the, the really super genius guy, but it, they went out of business. So I don't, there will be some of that, and there will be silly people will, who will care that their child has blue eyes or green eyes or something. I don't think it'll be very many. I think that's more bar conversation than reality. At least I hope so. Hi, uh, I'm wondering uh, in the CRISPR community, like, uh, are there any specific steps or like uh, ways that they communicate, and what are some steps they're taking to be transparent about the development of the technology? Well, that's a really good question too. Um, what's going on now is people are communicating amongst themselves. They're a little bit afraid to to talk about this in public because, you know, they're breaking new ground and the regulators and the people that you know, have the weapons are always, you know, not very happy with things that are new and different. So they're careful, they, they communicate with each other, they, um, they have meetings sometimes, certain meetings that they have. Uh, there's a whole biohacking community, there's different kinds of biohackers. There's people who are into genetic editing, there's people who put implants in their hands, there's people who try to use their natural processes and use them much better. There's various different ways. Uh, but these people are doing it, and sometimes they're doing it because of family tragedies. They had a family member who had this problem, and you know, they lose maybe a sister, you know, of some terrible disease, and say, fuck that. I am making this happen, I don't care. This isn't gonna happen again to someone else like it happened to me. And they got a fair amount of people like that who were involved, and they don't care. Tough luck, I'm doing it. I'm making people better, and if you don't like it, lock me in a cage, screw you. So you get a fair amount of people like that too. And there's not any real central communication place that I know of, they just email with each other a lot of times with PGP. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for interesting talk. Uh, it was really interesting. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much.